in general just want you to be straight up and honest with them. And just talk from your heart. Just say what you're really thinking. And that's a, apparently a very rare commodity. Um, and the reason we get into so much trouble is that because our leaders, Israeli leaders, are, are, are so often dishonest with what they're really thinking, I don't think Bibi really wants a Palestinian state, but he says it to keep the Americans happy. I don't think he would oppose it if he would keep him prime minister, but I don't think that's genuinely his I idealism. Um, but he says it, and he gets everybody in so much trouble because he, he's not saying the truth. And we need somebody, elections are coming up, and we need someone who's going to step forward and tell the truth. And the truth is that this land, the, the, the state of Israel, the Jewish state, is the only country in human history that was created by a sovereign act of God. No, no, the reason we will not allow an Arab state to be formed west of the Jordan River is not because of uh, security concerns. I respect those who say secure, that, that's true. You can't have a country that's narrower, narrower than, than Dallas Fort Worth Airport, which it would be. <laughs> you know, Dallas, DFW actually has its own zip code, and it would be larger. Its girth would be larger than the state of Israel. If, if uh, so, but that's not why. That is not the fundamental reason why we will not give up our land. We will not divide the land. The reason is it was given by God to the people of Israel, and we dare not throw that back. We dare not do that. That's the reason why, because it was given to the Jewish people. It was promised to the nation of Israel. And it was promised to the nation of Israel. And this is critical. And we have to be aware of it. We have to be cognizant of it. We only have a few minutes left. We have four minutes. And I want to bring out a point. I want to, I want to share something with you. When Abraham came to purchase the tomb, uh, what would be a burial place for Sarah, in Hebron, in Kirit, in Kirit Arba, he Hebron. When he did that, he was told he was the he was told by the local people first initially, you don't have to pay for it. I'll give it to you for free, for free. And Avram Avinu said no. He said I want to buy it and I want to pay. I will I want to pay full price, right? So the question right. and he paid a fantastic amount of money for it. The question is, why? Why did he do that? Why didn't he accept the gift? Why did he buy it? Now, the re why did he pay for something he can get for free? But the question, I want to compress this question. And I'm going to come back after the news break. I want to see if any of you can answer this question. The question becomes more profound and is italicized by the following. God had promised this land to Abraham and his descendants which means he had it anyway. Do you get it? That means God already had promised Abraham in Genesis 15 so that this land, everything you see, belongs to you and to your seed forever. So why would he pay for something that already belongs to him? So we have a multi-level, a multilateral question here. And I'm asking you this question, and you, my listeners, I want an answer from you. Why would Abraham pay? Pay, say, demand to pay for something and to pay the absolute high market value for this land, for this plot of land in Judea, why did he, when he was offered it for free? That's question number one. And question number two is, why would he, why would he um, pay for something that God said it's going to be yours anyway? Did he not trust in that? So why did he buy it? I hope you understand that twofold question. And, and therefore, this goes to the question of why is it so important to settle the land of Israel, particularly Judea and Samaria? These are our heroes. These are the people of the land. Well, it happens to be that the Bible said that land belongs to the Jewish people. No matter what, no matter what, there will never be a Palestinian state there. And it is given to us. It is given to us, and it was inscribed and seared in the lease that's locked in a vault in heaven. It cannot be undone by Obama. The question is then, why is it so important to settle the land? It is going to be ours, whether we whether we move there, we risk our children, or don't risk our lives there. 
it's going to belong to us. So why do we pay triple the price like Abraham did, which we do. Jews just moved in to the city of David, paid a fortune way above market value for it. Why are we doing that? Why? You better have an answer if I, you want to be able to listen to the show. 888-780-2425. Why did Abraham pay for land over its value? Even though God said it's going to belong to you and he was going for free. And why are we willing to risk our lives to live in the Holy Land right now when we're going to have it anyway? I want an answer from you. You'll call me back after news break. North America, 888-780-2425. You listen to Toby Singh. Show. And the question is the following. We see many times in Scripture that that our the leaders of our people, the founders of our nation, were wanted to insist on paying a full price for the land, as Abraham did in Genesis 23, where he, where, where he's told by, by the people of the land, we'll give it to you for nothing. He says, no, I'm going to pay over la secha, I'm going to pay the, the absolute amount. And if you look at the text in 23 verse 15, you'll notice something very interesting there. The, the, so first, he says, take it for nothing. If you notice then, he says, listen to me, the land is worth 400 shekels, but it actually doesn't just say shekels. Um, he actually said, Abraham offers him not 400 shekels, ordinary shekels, but it's a special kind of shekel, and it's called a shekel kesef. A shekel kesef is, is not a, a ordinary currency, and I, I'm going to go to May in just a moment, but shekel kesef, it means a special kind of shekel that was pure silver, and its value was 100 times the value of an ordinary shekel, shekel kesef. Look at the text, it's a unique shekel. And therefore, Abraham offered him 40,000 shekels, 40,000 shekels, way over the price to bury his dead. Why would he do that? If A, he knew this land would belong to him, God promised it to him, B, he was offered it for free. We have May joining us on air from Colorado. Welcome to the show. What do you say, May? First of all, I say that this... This gauntlet is really fun, fun little game. This is cool. Um, and then the other thing I say is that anything that I could probably um, have insight into is nothing compared to what you could teach us, so that's just a preemptive answer. <clears throat> but when, um, when God promised the land to Abraham and told Abraham, he, he didn't tell Abraham and the guy who was buying it from and their whole nation like he did to, uh, you know, when he, when he uh, gave the Torah on Mount Sinai, the whole nation heard it. So this guy doesn't know that the land is Abraham's, right? So, so um, you know, Abraham's got to go about doing things and uh, kind of, uh, you know, above board, you know, by the books. And then the other thing is that, you know, if the guy gave it to him, then, uh, then the guy could say, hey, I, I did Abraham a favor here, you know. You can't credit it to God because I gave it to him. So... I think, does that answer both questions? Hmm. So what you're saying, I think, is that God gave this land to right. Abraham and to his descendants, but Abraham had to do something that was not necessarily the a lease, but it was psychologically, to make it clear, to all generations that would follow, psychologically that the nation would understand his people his descendants this land belongs to them is that what you're saying to make that clear to all future generations may you got to shut off your uh we lost you there i think that's what may was saying is that you had to make it clear to all generations, and today we have to make it clear to the people of Israel that this land belongs to us. You know, there was a time, and this may shock people, when uh, in Shechem, what is called Nabalus, try not to call it Nabalus if you can avoid it, but Shechem is a city that Jews lived in. It was a city that had a major yeshiva in it, and Shechem was given over to the Arabs uh, 
in the is part of the Oslo Accords, and the agreement was that a yeshiva would remain there by Joseph's tomb. And the Arabs went and they destroyed it. They killed the Jews. The, the soldier bled to death. It was a horrible scene. They attacked Joseph's tomb, and there are no Jews left in Shechem today. Even though part of the Oslo Accords is that this part of Shechem does is under Israel's control, being um, in Area C, but still, what happened was Israel relinquished it, and they, it's a very big tragedy. There was one soldier, who was a Druze soldier, and as they they killed him, but he actually bled to death. It was a horrible death, and they didn't go in to save him. They didn't go in to get him out. And there are no Jews in Shechem today. If you want to visit Joseph's tomb, you can only do it under under a military uh, escort. And may I think I have you back there. Does that do I hear you in the background? Yes. Okay. You go ahead. Continue with your thoughts. We got cut off there. I can actually just barely hear you, so if I end up talking and then I hear the broadcast and I'm like I'm talking over you, it's not because I'm interrupting you, so it's because I can't hear you because you're so soft through my phone. But um do, do I have time for two questions or do you have a bunch of callers lined up? No, go, go ahead, go. Okay, so the first one is, um, I've been hearing kind of conflicting reports about uh, whether or not it's okay to have pets. Since you mentioned pets, even this is, and this came up a few days ago in a, in a, in a group, um, whether or not it's okay to have pets because they're, you know, let's say they're dogs or cats or birds or an unkosher animal. Not like you would eat your pets, right? Come on, you know? But something about, you know, you can't pet them or something like that. What is the deal with pets right. and, being, so and me, you know, converting me, to orthodox? Let me, let me answer that question. You definitely are allowed to have a pet. The only thing is, of course, it's a beautiful thing to have a pet, a wonderful thing, and you could pet them and enjoy them and so on and learn from them. In fact, our sages tell us that we look at, we observe a dog and a dog is an animal that always shows gratitude and is loyal, unlike the two-legged people. Uh, the four-legged doggy is Kolev. That's why its name is Hebrew, Kelev. It's all heart, and we should learn from the dog, and we should learn modesty from the cat. The reason why very pious Jews are concerned about having a pet they're concerned about it is a completely different reason. That is that it is a very grave sin to be cruel to an animal, sar balachayim, to cause an animal anguish and pain. And therefore, when you bring an animal into your home, so when you do that, you, you now have this enormous responsibility to care for this animal. And you have to be sure that you um, you don't you know don't cause it any anguish and pain and sorrow and so on. So there's concern for that. There is concern that a religious Jew will not fix their animal, castrate their animal. Um, one one is not permitted to do that. So it makes it a little tricky. So that's the only reason why some. I, 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 it's sort of some Jew, Orthodox Jews, there is there's no reason not to have a pet. You should have a pet and enjoy it. But I think that some Jews recognize the enormity, the responsibility that you have by having a pet. You have to care for it. You can't cause an animal pain. You can't cause an animal discomfort, so on and so forth. So I think that's the reason why uh, people are concerned about having a pet. But there's no... Not, not, no prohibition whatsoever to have animals. This was normal in the, you know, people had animals, although not always pets, but people had animals. That was normal. So, yeah. See, now, my brain goes through this place because, you know, I just, um, I was hearing your show yesterday and um, about, you know, we're given Torah not so, like, don't sin, but, for, like, if you do sin, that you care what you do, right? So, so it, it's like, uh, 
people cause pain. That's just what happens, right? So, well, here's the crazy thing. Like, why would somebody be afraid to bring an animal into their house because they, cause they're not allowed to hurt the animal or do anything wrong in some way, whether by negligence or ignorance, right? You just, you just fix it. You just figure it out and do the right thing. But if they're, why, I just don't get it. Why are they afraid to bring an animal into their house? But well, they're not afraid they're to bring really, a human into their house by, by having children. But, 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 but having children isn't that big a responsibility, you know? <laughs> no, no, listen, okay. It is not true. Okay. That means that what you've heard that uh, Orthodox Jews don't have pets or Lugna, that's just not factually correct. One could say, I think, there is just a concern that if you have a pet, that you... Uh, that you take care of it because the penalty for uh, for causing an animal anguish and pain is very great. So you therefore uh, you're therefore held accountable. I, I think I think more so among Hasidic Jews, it just may not be culturally their thing. But you know, in my family, gotcha. my father, who is a rabbi, a very much a black hat rabbi, when he was a child growing up, he had a, a dog and loved it. And my grandmother, God rest her soul, Allah Shalom, they had a dog and that was normal. There, there is, it's just not correct. It's just, it's a misnomer. There is a just someone has to know that that one has to be careful to always care for the animal you're taking apart. But it is it just would not be correct to say um, that Orthodox Jews don't have pets. It just not it just isn't true. It could be that Hasidic Jews. It's just not. I think. It's probably not a part of their culture, maybe because it's difficult, you know, especially in the inner city to, you know, if you grow up in, if you're in Williamsburg, New York, it's tough to have a dog, you know, but in the, in what's called the Alta Haim means go back to Hungary, go back to Romania, go back to Poland, where people lived in the shtetl, they lived in a town like Anatevka. People had all kinds of animals, but it was very hard in the inner city. It just wasn't a part of their uh, Weltanschauung in the inner city. Jews did not move to Colorado. Orthodox Jews did not move to uh, Colorado Springs. They just didn't. They were in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And that just wasn't going, that wasn't the environment consistent for caring for an animal that now needs to be walked and needs to be and so on. But in the in, if you go to Romania, Jews who live in the Pale Settlement, Jews, Orthodox, devoutly Orthodox Jews, had, had pets. That was common because the animal could just run comfortably and freely. Okay? Right on. So, um, can I ask another question? Yes, of course. Okay. Um, I remember, um, like, about a month ago, you were talking about... and. Uh, and when you explained this, certain other things made a lot of sense to me, like things kind of fell into place. Um, you were talking about, um, in the Q&A after the debate, how it's such an egregious thing to make uh, a convert cry, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. The Bible says then, of course, so. there's the question of, right, then there's like, okay, well, so... There's kind of two parts to this question. Like the first part is, well, so is it less of a bad thing if you make a pre-convert cry? But that's okay. So then the other part of the question is, um, like I learned that there was an experiment done where where um, different tears were harvested after a person was like cause different emotions will elicit different types of tears, and those tears are visually different viewed under a microscope. The crystalline structure of those tears are different under the microscope, right? So you have like yeah. this whole entire forest full of different types of trees or different types of tears, right? So so my question is like, well, what if you make a convert cry from joy or cry from gratitude? Is it kind of like a, a blessing instead of a curse or is it just you just get, you know, you know, in trouble for the one type of, of tear, like tears of, of of pain and sadness, just like, uh, you know, like, kind of like that one tree that Adam and Eve weren't supposed to eat in the garden. What about that? Okay. 
Uh, the Torah says, Hashem says in Exodus chapter 22, verse 22, so it's pretty easy to remember, verse 23, excuse me, uh, verse 22, text, the, the Torah says these words, Im ane sa'ane oisoi, if you will afflict them, okay, ki im sa'oik yitzaik elai, and they will cry out and call out to me. The Torah says, Shamoya Eshma Tsakosoi. I will surely hear their cry. So the Torah says. The Torah warns us that to be very careful. And the context is the, the context is to cause pain and anguish to the most vulnerable members of society. It's the, and the Torah is, will be very angry with us because we should have known better. One of the things that people ask me all the time, and I was asked this on another show recently, is does, how does, does God punish people who don't know about the Torah, who don't know little about it? And I explain that Hashem judges each person based on what they know and what they understand. And no one's held accountable for what they didn't know. Obviously, just as we have that kind of mercy. And if you look at the Torah very carefully, you'll see there, the Torah says in, in Exodus 22, and I think it's interesting to, um, to look at Exodus 22 in context. So the Torah is saying there, the Torah is saying something really, is saying there that the reason why I'm going to hold you so accountable Ki gerim, if you go back just a few verses, ki gerim hayisem be'eretz Yisrael, because you were slaves in Yisrael, you were there, you know what it's like to be weak, you know what it's like to have a boot clamped to your cheek, you know what it's like to have your face in the dirt. The Torah tells us that the reason why we're held so accountable for hurting innocent people. In fact, the verse, it, this incidentally comes right after the Ten Commandments. Uh, the Torah says, V'ger loisene, loisene, uh, you, you cannot, may not hate the, the convert, you can't cause them pain. Why? Ki gerim heyisem be'eretzam. You yourself were, were gerim, you were strangers in the land. You were in Egypt, you know you must never cause a widow or an orphan uh, pain, afflict them, right? Because if you do that, they'll cry out to me. I will, I will hear the, I will hear their calls. I will see their tears. If you do that, my anger will flare up, and I will cause terrible, terrible things to happen to you. So the Torah is holding us accountable because you were there, you understand. And because the ger, the convert, has no family, that means that, let's take you, May, you're willing to walk away from everything. Jewish people are radioactive right now. The world hates us. You could very easily hide among the Gentile nations and deny any association with the Jewish people. In Jewish tradition, you have a Jewish neshama, if you are so called. And therefore, you're a stranger. See, it's interesting, the term in the text is ger. Ger doesn't mean a convert. Ger really means a stranger. So let's think about this for a moment. If the, the, a Jew in Egypt is a stranger because we are in a land that is not ours, so we're in an alien environment. So how is a ger a stranger? A ger is a stranger to the to the ger's Gentile neighbors with whom you were raised, May. You were raised among Gentiles, raised to believe you're a Gentile. And in fact, you didn't belong with them. So you're a stranger. You really belong with the Jewish people. You're not at home and you will never be at peace unless you are, you are a part of the Jewish people, and that's why you're called to us. And therefore, someone who afflicts someone who has no protection because you're willing to walk away from everything, 
you willing to walk away from the of being a among the nations a Gentile, and therefore no one, the New York Times doesn't hate you, and the Guardian doesn't hate you, and the European Union doesn't hate you, and Hamas doesn't hate you, and you're saying, no, I want to be counted among the Jewish people, because that is really my, not just my shared heritage, but I want to share in their destiny, and I'm willing to suffer as a Jew, but know this, that as such, the Jew is called upon to say, that means May, and that means Philip, who's listening to the show and Brian, who's listening to the show, these are all people who are gayrim, which means they're strangers among the Gentiles. They don't belong there. You are an imposter Gentile, and therefore, when it, because remember this, as I've explained so. Oh, we're going. We're almost at the end. As I've explained so many times, you can't. How could someone convert to Judaism? You could join the belief of the people of Israel, but how do you change your race? You can't become black or Asian. The answer is that you you were always a part of the nation of Israel. And Hashem says, be careful. Do not do to them what was done to you, because they are strangers. And you listen to Singer, and it's Israel National Radio. Abraham bought that land, so we should know. We should understand. He risked it all, and the people of Israel risk it all today, living under the conditions Judea and Samaria, so the world will know and will never lose hope and be kind to those who are strangers. 25 mitzvot, 25 commandments you fulfilled when you're kind to a stranger. You listen to singer Israel National Radio. Sign